ਕਰਕੇ ਕੋ ਮੇਰੇ ਬੱਚਾ ਆਹ ਵਾਰ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਗੋਦਾ ਕਿ ਸਟਾਰਟਸ ਇਫ ਥੈਟਸ ਓਕੇ ਵਿਦ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਆਮ ਥਿਸ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਥਿ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਆਵਰ ਆਮ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਬਲੀ 45 ਮਿੰਟਸ ਔਰ ਸੋ ਆਮ ਆਈ ਵਾਂਟ ਟੂ ਮੂਵ ਬੈਕ ਟੂ ਥਿ ਸਿਟੀ ਸਕੇਲ ਐਂਡ and and show some visions of of a potential future based upon some um, some work that we've done and and, and a competition that we ran and this is uh really about me thinking uh, the paradigm you guys remember my my son from the video <laughs> this is uh, his hair was all messy we were at the beach but you see the you see the uh the shirt that lay my parents <laughs> So uh this question of the cities of the future is one that we're very interested in and like I mentioned at the beginning of my talk when we think about the future we we like to start with an exploration of the past uh because it's it's uh, incredibly instructive to look at the way things have changed in the past and the question of how our children live uh in the future is incredibly important right So we talk about as I mentioned in the video that we we want communities that are not just ecologically restored but continue to be culturally rich and and socially just uh, for for everybody and not just for those that can afford to live in nice places. So when we go back and we look at the past and we look at ideas of the future from the past. So this is very interesting um for those of you that are architects uh, or planners um when you when you look back uh in terms of visions from famous architects and planners about the future it's really interesting to look at what uh, they thought was going to be the paradigm and this image has a bucky fuller's a dome over midtown manhattan uh and then you see uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City and Corbusier's uh Radial City uh for Paris and and so just spend a uh, Radial City um we'll spend just a couple minutes on this just it's kind of interesting that this was Corbusier's vision for the center of Paris the the idea was that we would tear down the heart of Paris and we would put up these uh identical towers of housing and we would destroy you know this the, the cultural context of several you know 100 several hundred years of architecture uh with something like this this was a very serious proposal by Corbusier uh to the city of Paris and you can imagine uh uh what would it be like there uh if if this had been done and thankfully the Parisians didn't think that this was a good idea but many in America thought it was a good idea and uh, many other cities around the world including here in Mexico City um where we we basically built you know cheaper versions of Forbes vision and created these kind of communities which are really disconnected from the landscape and end up often being very dangerous um uh, for people to 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 actually live in this is a very famous development um in St. Louis called Pruitt Eagle um and it was originally built to replace a traditional neighborhood that had been that had grown up over a century that was like this and they they basically as you can see they just sort of tore the whole thing down and forced the residents out and then they built these towers and they you know had them come back and of course this is for you know the poor you know not not for the for the richer citizens this was this the scheme and the uh it won a lot of awards and was praised uh as a, as a, this great vision of how people will live and it was such a terrible place to live that they actually uh dynamited the whole thing only about 20 years after building it because it became this gang infested um dangerous place uh to be because they had destroyed the cultural fabric uh and the and the you know the connection to people to their neighbors in that community um this is a vision that Frank Lloyd Wright really pushed and uh and it was an idea that that it was again celebrating the automobile as this great democratic thing where people can you know go where they want to go and in this vision there's nuclear powered helicopters that he thought might be invented uh in the near future 
And this was the idea that everyone should have their own sort of piece of land um, at the edge, you know, at the edge that we all drive to, and it'll be nice, and you know, there's no traffic jams envisioned. It's very idyllic, and there might be these towers, but we would go very far to our homes, and we'd have this, you know, best of both worlds of living in nature, sort of, and having, you know, uh, cities. And we actually did build, you know, we built this vision without the, without the, the nuclear power and helicopters. But we built these kind of developments all over the U.S. and Canada, and I'm sure here uh, in many places in your country. And the reality has been very different than the vision in terms of the impacts on the lives of people and the, the automobile impact and the amount of time for the average citizen that is co-opted uh, by the car. And it's kind of even more interesting when you, even, when you go back uh, even a little bit further and you look at where and how people thought we were going to live by now. And, and there were many people that believed that we were gonna you know, be living in colonies on the moon by now, and that we would have space stations that would orbit the planet, and we will have figured out how to terraform the interiors of these space environments, and we would live this, this idyllic suburban lifestyle um, you know, within, within these space stations, right? So this was, this was you know, considered, this was sort of visions from the, from the 50s of how we were going to live uh, around now uh, in, 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 our, in our world. The, you know, we were going to be so successful and so smart that we were going to, you know, continue our civilization in outer space, right? You guys have seen images like this in different places. And, and there was a lot of, you know, this is the Jetsons and, and, and uh, there's, there's a lot of flying spaceships and, um, and, and such. Um, it's interesting when you then, uh, well, this is some more <laughs> recent examples. Of, uh, when you actually fast forward uh, to the 70s, uh, something happens, and I'm going to come back to this one here in a minute. Um, you, f you fast forward to the 70s, and when you look at some popular media um, in, in the 80s and the 90s, our vision of what the future would look like began to change, and it really began to change from sort of a very optimistic scenario to one that was, there was an increasing amount of images more like Mad Max or Blade Runner, uh, right? You've seen, you know, seen the movies where, uh, or, or visions, if you look at any visions of the future now in science fiction uh, and movies and TV shows, it's often of this sort of hyper-density that goes even beyond the Shanghai's level of density and, and where you, what, what's missing is any, any trees, any life um, that, you know, that we're just, this is what is considered the future that we're going to have. And that we're, yes, we're going to have these, um, you know, flying cars again, but, the, you know, this, this sort of incredible disconnect between where we are will continue. We'll always have Coca-Cola, <laughs> and we'll always have sort of these industrial systems, but again, no trees, no plants. And what's interesting about this is from, from an ecological standpoint, it's actually impossible. We, if th this can't be the future because it's impossible to sustain communities at this sort of scale and density and resources uh, that they would need to function. How would we feed ourselves? How would we actually provide uh, for our children? So these are, these are truly science fiction in that the, an ecological collapse uh, will happen long before this kind of density ever becomes a reality. But this is really in the mindsets of, 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 of many people about where we're headed. It's a very sort of depressing uh, future. And we may, you know, many places, we're, we're more and more heading, heading, heading to scenes like this, uh, which is scary, um, but it can't continue, right? And, and, and we're building all over the world, you know, examples uh, of here in Mexico City and, and many places of, of the kind of communities that are deeply uh, disturbing to me. Now, um, one of the things that's interesting that's happening more recently in science fiction uh, is this notion of our technology deciding that we are so worthless as a species that they, that it, you know, that it needs to get rid of us, that we have become a cancer uh, on the planet. And it's interesting when you look at the numbers of movies that are out there about this now, it's really interesting. And now there's all this, there's this fascination with zombies, right? Zombies are the new, the new tech, this is the new paradigm that whether, if it's not technology, it's gonna be a super virus that's gonna turn us into cannibalistic 
you know, creatures that were with each other. And um, this is part of this sort of collective angst, I think, that we're feeling around the world of hopelessness, that, that there isn't a very good future for us in civilization because of where we're headed and how fast we're headed to some place. And it's even beginning to pop up in terms of the, the media that our children watch. And, and these are two movies. How many have seen these movies? Here, these two. A few. Um, this is uh, Wall-E, which is Pixar and Disney. And uh, this one, um, I'm suddenly forgetting what this one is. Is it called Nine? And, um, and in both of these, the, the, the premise is that humanity has gone extinct, and all that's left are the cute little robots that we created. And these are children's movies, and they're fantastic movies from an artistic standpoint, and very and funny and all that. But the underlying psychology that we're telling our kids is there's no hope, and that the, 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 the earth will be left as piles of garbage and rubbish from a species that couldn't figure out how to survive on the planet. And this is, again, it's becoming, if you think about it, watch this when you go back on TV and the images that you see, uh, this is more and more popping up as a storyline. And we believe we need to begin to change the stories, that the stories that we create about how we should live have real power. And storytelling and mythology uh, are very important uh, to, our, to our civilization, right? It, it, look at Mexico and how Mexico City developed and the, the mythologies and the stories that govern why this city is even in this place and why it was developed the way it was developed. It was all based on very powerful belief systems, and that's the same all over the world. But so this notion that we that we uh, have to accept a paradigm based on stories of inevitability, I think, is flawed. Unfortunately, we're moving in this direction, but we need to begin to replace these things with other ideas. And to me, it's not merely a matter of shrubbing up the current paradigm. Right? And I, I think these are, these are these are interesting architectural statements, and I, I, I think that they. Um, they're fascinating in many many ways, but but it gets back to this notion of, of, of just sort of making a minor tweak to the current paradigm and, and thinking that that's going to be enough, right? And so we, we, we believe that we need to look very differently at our cities and the fact that there are models and communities that work incredibly well. And, and in fact, uh, many northern European cities work very, very well. They still have a, a, a large room to improve in terms of their energy systems and, and in terms of some of their infrastructure. Um, but they actually perform very, very well. And in terms of looking at, look at the integration of ag food systems and, and urbanity in this little village. This is, this is integration. Uh, a, a community that has, has continued to feed itself and continue to have sort of vitality. And there's actually quite a bit of density. There's quite a bit of density in this little community, way more density than Atlanta in terms of the per capita density there. And yet they can walk to their, their primary food sources. They can walk to natural environments. And it's a very different model. Where, yeah. where is that? Huh? This, this is in Bavaria, in Germany. And this is in this is Stockholm, in Sweden. And so while these are not perfect, they are, they are very instructive from a variety of, of standpoints. Because we used to live in living cities. We used to live and build only living buildings. <laughs> we forget that not that long ago, that we have changed. Our use of technology and our appetite for things has changed dramatically. As we rewrote the story of humanity's role in nature, we rewrote the story about where our place was in nature. There's a very different outlook that happened from the Industrial Revolution onwards, right? So this, we, um, I don't know if some of you entered this competition or not, but we uh, had launched a competition a little over a year ago to ask designers around the world to reimagine their communities as living cities. And, and we got a lot of interesting um, examples. And I, my staff pulled together just some of the images from some of the entries. Um, um, and I wanted to go through some trends and ideas here that I think are interesting. <coughs> Because when we look at the future, we don't think that it's, that it's going to be a, a Blade Runner future, or at least it shouldn't be. And that when we look at the way cities need to operate in the future, uh, there's some different principles that perhaps uh, occur, especially when you begin to apply the principles of the Living Building Challenge at a larger scale. And one of the things that was interesting, so we got in this competition, we got 
entries from all over the world, and they had to look at how their their communities, not sort of not creating new eco towns, but how actually they would take existing communities and begin to do the right things to uh, create a healthier uh, environment from from all perspectives. And one of the trends that emerged in many of the entries, which we think is quite interesting, is really again the notion of, of, of the preservation of much of the historic fabric that is in communities that we've built. And this is actually uh, a vision for a part of downtown Seattle in the future. And so it's interesting things here that, that in reality are not here. This canal doesn't exist. It used to exist, but it was covered over and piped and, and the, the, the waterways of the community were buried. And this, of course, hap has happened in cities all over the world where we've taken natural streams and waterways. I mean, look at, you know, there was a lake, <laughs> a huge lake uh, here. Uh, and and this, this is the idea of beginning to reemerge the, the natural historic fabric of community and realizing that there's a huge ecological investment already made in existing infrastructure and that the, the idea of retrofitting, upgrading, and improving existing uh, infrastructure uh, is a, huge, you know, a hugely important step to take. And so interesting that in a competition about the future, that there was, we had so many people that were really saying, well, we need to actually, the future needs to encompass uh, the, the, the powerful preservation of what we have. And how do you take a city like Seattle in this case? And I have several examples in Seattle in the slideshow because it's, it's the city where I live. And how do you begin to retrofit the infrastructure and introduce green infrastructure into the fabric of the community? And so you start to see a decentralized network of energy generation systems. You start to see from the roof level uh, networks of green green roofs. Are there many green roofs in Mexico City yet? There's a few. Not a few. Yeah, a few. And, and so you also see here the reemergence of canals and waterways that um, have been buried and piped. <coughs> so pretty interesting. And from the sort of bird's eye view, uh, a very different paradigm. So the other thing that, that, that we're believing is important as we transition, um, and, and we see this, I mean, you've seen this uh, here in, in Mexico with, with earthquakes and, and with uh, hurricanes. Um, and in the U.S. with tornadoes and hurricanes and, and storms, with from New Orleans to uh, you know, Joplin, Missouri, there's to to Houston, um, there the, when there is a great when there is a great disaster, um, our cities become incredibly vulnerable because of the, the the infrastructure, the centralized infrastructure that we've built, and so it's very very uh, you know scary when when. You lose water service to millions of people when one event happens, and to fix those kind of problems become incredibly expensive. And and so we are actually encouraging and seeing a rise of interest in this notion of instead of this sort of 19th century centralized infrastructure paradigm that we've been building around the world for water and waste and energy, that we instead have a decentralized, distributed, diverse network of infrastructure that happens at a neighborhood and district scale. And what that does is it builds in a lot of resilience, uh, whether there are events, and it builds in a lot of flexibility for solutions that can be adapted to the specifics of the place. And that's a very important idea to think about. And so Seattle, and if you know, Seattle has, and it will have, knock on wood, at some point very soon, uh, a, another earthquake, which you know, right now could create a lot of uh, havoc in the community beyond just the initial, um, the initial impact of buildings, as you know, the community is not designed uh, in a resilient manner from an infrastructure perspective. Right? And it's the same with our food systems as well. So I'm going to go into some of these examples. <coughs> this is a part, again, of, of a series of really looking at uh, how we begin to uh, see the reemergence of natural systems as an important part of the physical infrastructure of our communities rather than something that's always piped and hidden. If you remember back to the beginning of my presentation, that idea of a sewage treatment plant that was a community center and not something that we were ashamed of, and the idea that we handled stormwater in elegant, beautiful ways 
uh, is, is really important. Um, so I'm going to go through a lot more ideas. And this is one that I think that I, I hope that you would agree and it's really uh, a trend that I'm concerned about is that for, for many years what we've been doing is we've been pulling children out of our cities and off of our streets and become, uh, there's less and less um, of, of activity uh, of youth in the social fabric of communities, right? And more and more Xboxes and video games and TV screens and in, uh, in living rooms. And I think that this is actually doing uh, a huge amount of damage from a psychological standpoint if, if that's not balanced with opportunities for unstructured play in natural, in natural settings with trees and plants. And they've actually begun to do lots of studies um, I'm looking at parts of the brain that are activated when people are around different environments and when and a, chill, a child around a tree lights up way more areas of the brain than a chill, child um, watching an image on a television screen is that that's because how we, you know, we evolved and the amount of information that, that comes through not only uh, visually but tactically in terms of you know, materials uh, from a smell standpoint, the huge amount of information we gain from the smell of the tree, and also from an audible standpoint, that our, what we're picking up signals and information that we have no idea that we're even picking up when we're around a stream or a park. It's like everything is firing us, right? It's bringing us alive. But when we're in sterile environments uh, that don't have this sort of capacity, we're actually diminished and made less psychologically healthy. So the idea that we need to create community infrastructure that reconnects uh, our children in particular with natural environments is hugely important. Now another, another whole area that, that was interesting to us in many of these entries was the question of the automobile and, and peak oil. And, and um, this idea of what happens to cities that have been designed to function around the automobile and what happens when that paradigm uh, and what happens when when gas is too expensive for people to be driving around, right? And if you can imagine, if, if gas is four times, five times the cost that it is now, how many people suddenly wouldn't be able to afford to drive anywhere? It would suddenly change a lot of things very rapidly. What if it was ten times the cost or a hundred times the cost? Changes can happen rapidly. So what happens in communities? So we had a whole series of entries in this competition that were exploring the notion of of uh, beyond peak oil, and yet trying to, to look for solutions that were not depressing, but actually saying what this is actually could be an opportunity to redefine community that was actually healthier for people and the planet. And so you see, this is actually an image of Chicago, and there's things that are, you know, that these are wind turbines off the coast that actually don't uh, exist in reality. Uh, and, and, and in this particular entry, you begin to, to see a different question uh, arise around what happens to all the streets and parks and boulevards, the, the sheer amount of land that we've given over uh, to automobile use. And so they're actually looking at this question of, well, maybe what happens, and this is a major street uh, in, in downtown Chicago, maybe the question should be, how do we reintroduce the prairie back into the city? And this is a question, as we've developed our cities, we've pushed nature and nature, nature further and further uh, out into the periphery, and it suggests that somehow we're separate from nature, that there's the natural environment and the built environment. And many of these entries are looking at this idea of saying, no, what happens if we begin to knit back together natural systems and built systems so that they aren't so disconnected? And how do you do that as a transition in a place like Chicago? And this, this entry was one of the things we found so fascinating about is they really pushed this question really far and said, well, what about food systems? And, and maybe you even begin to see shepherds. If you, the moment you start bringing the prairie into the city, maybe you actually start seeing shepherds coming into the city with flocks of sheep. And that maybe this is a good thing. And instead of, uh, you, know, you know, people could actually uh, be more connected to their food systems in a different way. Interesting question. Uh, pretty interesting image uh, in a industrial, a former industrial uh, area of Chicago, the notion of urban shepherds there right now would be considered crazy. Um, and, and here's, uh, you know, the, the, the dog that is helping to guide the sheep uh, into the city. So you can see the kind of questions that these things raise. Um, and this, this was uh, an entry that, that we ended up choosing as the winning entry. There were several images and a whole, you know, a lot of information went behind it. 
because it asked, it presented a very, a series of very evocative questions about a community, as we've already talked about, that in many ways functions very well. It's not a restorative, regenerative city, but it's much greener than most cities because of how it's designed. But how would you actually create, recreate Paris while, you know, uh, respecting what's already there and do so in a, in a world where there isn't the automobile as the paradigm? And, and that there, there isn't the need for, for nuclear power plants and coal generation. And you begin to look at the integration of technology and natural systems into the historic fabric of, of Paris and how you could begin to, uh, you know, use the, to continue to use the, the, the great infrastructure that's there, like Place, in Place Vendôme, but at uh, the roof level you might have photovoltaic systems generate all the electricity that these buildings would, be, would have been retrofitted to be more efficient and that we would actually begin to change the way the system works above and below ground. And actually, if you start to think about what it might be like, it would be a quieter Paris, it would be a cleaner Paris, it would be a nicer Paris to be in, and better for the planet at the same time. So pretty interesting when you look at this, and this was the image that got a lot of the judges, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still classic Paris, but this is with, like, the solar array of the, the building in, in, uh, in Seattle is a network of distributed uh, energy generation that, that produces no uh, pollution um, while it's generating electricity. And these streets now begin to take a very different life um, without, without cars. And this image here is an image of the Champs-Élysées, which if you visited the Champs-Élysées, you kind of expect to have this romantic experience, but then you're kind of overwhelmed by all the cars that are zooming by. <laughs> you're like, I want to just take a good picture, but I, you know, it's, it's a matter. And so this is saying, well, what if maybe the paradigm in the future, if we got rid of the automobile, uh, could actually be a, um, a much richer experience. And if you uh, are looking at the Living Building Challenge and its requirements for, for food production, etc., you begin to see that we could have some really interesting uh, interventions of agriculture as well into the heart of our communities, which could create uh, a very you know, powerful uh, a place to live from that perspective. So this is a revisioning of the Chambre What's that? The little place. Where is the little? The it's around the 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 little the the, the, the cabaret. <laughs> <laughs> so the police. The uh, uh, little the little the cabaret. I know. It's a cabaret. Oh, the cabaret. <laughs> it's around there. Yes. So here you see a re revisioning of the street that was cars into even more of a, of a welcoming community. But below ground, you see that there's an even greater investment in public transportation. So the people aren't confined to just the neighborhoods. Their neighborhoods are more walkable, safer to be in, much more uh, pleasant experience, but they still can get from one area of the city to the other. In fact, more quickly and more conveniently than in the current paradigm, but using a fraction of the energy and resources to do so. So very, very compelling vision of how you can even improve Paris, right? So if you finally go to Paris and say, we can improve your city, see what the French say. <laughs> They'd say, it can't be improved. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so there was another sort of grouping of, um, of entries, and this is very, um, and many of these were, were American entries that we found fascinating, and it's what to do with, with the kind of communities that that have popped up all over the U.S. Um, like Atlanta and these suburban communities that were, were set up around the automobile and built this kind of infrastructure. <coughs> and so this is actually looking, uh, looking at the landscape in a different way. And this particular image is, is saying, well, in, in many suburban communities you have these big box retail stores, kind of like I showed with in my hometown. And they actually could be repurposed as agricultural distribution nodes. And much of the land that, that has been either paved over or converted to low density uses could be converted back to agriculture and we could begin to repurpose much of, oops, much of the infrastructure. Oops, I, I clicked ahead uh, in different ways. And so this is actually uh, a series of images we got where they, where they literally looked at suburban sprawl communities and said, well, maybe what happens is is that, that, that we have a process in some places of, of deconstruction 
of whole uh, pieces of infrastructure, greater density in particular nodes that are then connected with public transportation, and a, a restoration of the natural or uh, agricultural fabric that should, should be in that place rather than sprawl, and, and how you, you could begin to transition existing communities uh, to this new paradigm, especially if, if many of these homes um, have become abandoned. And there are many places, of course, in the U.S. since the financial crisis where whole neighborhoods have simply been abandoned in suburban places because people can't afford uh, to drive the, the great distances and, 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 and it led to a lot of financial crisis in the U.S. And so we got a whole bunch of these images uh, of people saying, well, we really need to turn, repurpose suburbia in interesting ways. <coughs> this is kind of fun because um, I don't know why there's a reindeer in this image, um, but we had several entries um, that mysteriously each put reindeers or moose in their in their entries, and we don't know why, but they just showed up, and, and teams have never talked to each other. <laughs> um, and, and and so this is this this is another entry that carries that idea forward. It looks at um, Long Island. And, and begins to say instead of this sort of continuous sprawl of Long Island, you actually develop these, these nodes of higher density connected, you can see the red line, connected with infrastructure of, of, of rail, and then back to more green spaces, agricultural lands, etc. between them as a different model for, um, for, for land use patterns. And as, again, this is as a transition from what's there um, to what could be. <coughs> and very different than the Blade Runner image. And again, you see in this image um, the notion of um, uh, wind farms um, often on the coastline, etc. And this is how some of these urban cores, you know, could get re, um, reinvented, repurposed. And this, this is again, looking at this as a transition idea, you could have your typical, this is an Ikea, a typical parking lot that is you know, empty uh, for a lot of the day and then it's packed with cars for a period of time. And the idea of actually repurposing and redeveloping that land for greater density, but not density that's, that's crazy, but density where people again can have a walkable experience and, and can be connected to um, public transportation systems. So, uh, and what, what was another thing we found incredibly fascinating was the reconnection of food in many of these visions. In fact, um, just about all the visions um, really took food systems to a different level. And what we're seeing in our communities is a greater awareness of the disconnect of our food systems to uh, our culture and, and the huge impact of our, uh, of, of, of the transportation distances of, of, a, of a calorie of food um, in, in, in America in particular, but I'm sure here in Mexico as well. <coughs> we have a very fragile food network in the, in, in the world that's again based upon cheap oil to move things all over the globe. And we eat food out of season. We eat food that comes from very far distances. If you look at how far an apple often travels or you know, any other you know, um, staple in your, in your, in your pantry, um, there's huge ecological impacts associated with moving something as heavy as food and that quantity of food all over the planet. And, and, and it, what's interesting in, in cities like Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, that are starting to become more ecologically aware as whole communities, there's this re-emergence of urban food production, of, of, of people finding any patch of land that they can and growing food on it. And this is not, this is like, these are like architects and lawyers and doctors growing their own tomatoes wherever they can. And in the U.S., there's uh, something called the guerrilla garden movement, where people are 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 taking over plots of land uh, and just planting uh, planting their food in it, and and, and whether they're allowed to or not. Um, and it's really part of this sort of consciousness that we need to be more connected to our food systems. So a lot of the um, designs or visions of the future that we see take very sterile um, bits of public infrastructure and say, well, what if we began to transform them so the average 
calorie was not from thousands of miles away, but was actually from only a few miles away, or at the most a few hundred miles away. And what would that do to the design of our cities if we actually grew more of our food? <coughs> and we're seeing this um, in interesting places. I don't know if many of you have been to Detroit. Any Detroit folks here? A few? Um, where there is a big movement afoot um, to grow more and more of Detroit's food within the heart of the city. And Detroit has gone through a lot of change in the last 30 years. It's really had a, a tough time economically as many of the original automobile industries moved out of the city and left a lot of abandoned land and a lot of people fled the inner city. And so people are moving back, buying these inner city uh, plots and using them to have community gardens where people come together in a social way to, uh, to again, grow their own food and to interact and, and recreate the culture of food. And I, I think, you know, Mexico is blessed with a, with a real culture of food that I have seen that has really disappeared in many places, but I think it's being threatened as my, you know, threatened by um, um, a less local, a less cultural way of eating that is becoming more common. And we, and so the, the idea of a future where we re create the kind of intense cultures of food based upon what actually grows in a place and what belongs in a place. That, and that's why we have the great cuisines of the world where in cultures where people really intent, where people really had a strong connection to their agricultural base and, and grew things. And that's why in, I'd say in Canada and the US, the culture of food um, has been pretty poor uh, because of the, that disconnect. And it's, but it's starting to change. And so we're starting to see ideas for, you know, communities, Baltimore, Cleveland, Kansas City, where food systems are being brought right into the heart of the city. And, and that this is okay, this is encouraged. And how do we create policies to encourage this? And how do we create new community designs so that every resident has the ability to grow some, maybe not a huge portion of their food, but enough that they get dirt under their nails, enough that if they want to have chickens, they have chickens, if they, that they can do these things. And it actually increases the quality of life uh, for people. And, and it's interesting that um, for a long time in America, being a farmer was stigmatized. You, it was considered to be something that only, you know, you, you don't want to be a farmer, that's for poor people, or that's for people that, that aren't educated. But it's actually now, finally starting to change where it's being recognized that farming is a noble profession, that feeding civilization is an incredibly important act, and that it's something that we all should participate in to some degree, and we should support financially those that feed us in a different way than we do now. And so this is, it's interesting, these trends for, that, that could continue around that paradigm. This is an image um, in Portland that really gets at this issue, this culture of food that is emerging. And um, now, and, and Portland, I, I like to use Portland, um, as you've already learned, uh, in Portland, if you go into a downtown restaurant, you literally can almost ask what the chicken's name was that you're about to eat, because the, and the waiter has been educated as to where, where, which farm the lettuce came from, probably has visited the farm himself or herself, knows the farmer and what, if they didn't use chemicals or no chemicals in growing it, and this is starting to change, you know, the community and how it works in a really powerful way. And we need more of this. So we have a lot of these entries that really start to take a creative look at how food informs how we live. So um, the next kind of area is car-free cities and transportation. And when we look at what's going to win in the future, in some ways, the vehicle that is going to win is already won, and it's the bicycle, the most efficient invention that we've ever created to move long distances. But maybe with electric assist. <laughs> but the question of what do we do with city infrastructure that was designed for cars, and how do we begin to repurpose rights of way, sidewalk areas, streets, where before this would have had multiple lanes of cars, maybe there's still service access, but we begin to see that we can create different systems for water and waste conveyance, again, for food production, maybe only for public transportation system. The infrastructure of our buildings begin to knit together 
into a fabric, a district fabric, where certain buildings are generating energy and sharing resources and others are collecting water and sharing resources. Very, very different urban paradigm than the sort of sterile, sort of monochromatic paradigm that we have now. And so we got a lot of interesting examples of how you would begin to transition commun existing communities from the current paradigm and how you begin to reshape it over a period of time to have a living city. And maybe new vehicles emerge that are uh, powered differently. And in fact, this was an entry that we um, enjoyed. It was a student entry. And it was asking this question of how do, you, how do you grow a community at density yet keep the scale of the civilization such that the people there um, continue to enjoy the character of that place? And recognizing that if you have most of our cities have a huge amount of, 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 of its area just as streets, and what if you actually began to build architecture within the street sections and actually add density, and in this case also restoring waterways? If we no longer need cars in the same way that we do, then perhaps we have suddenly have a ton of land available to us for a different type of community interaction, a different scale of infrastructure that's more human scale, Density, yes, that's much denser than what's currently there, but not without uh, incredible building heights, etc. Pretty interesting uh, vision of how we might transform a city. And you see again in these images that food production is, is everywhere, right? You know, beekeepers and, and, and children being involved in uh, this very high-tech device here. A very different vision of the future than, than labor. And uh, would you agree that this would be a nicer place to live than, than the way we are Christians? And then each of these walkable nodes connected to high-speed rail lines and infrastructure that's clean and much safer to be in. And then you see people biking. I have a lot of colleagues uh, in Seattle and, and Portland and Vancouver. Even when it's downpouring rain, they're out there on their bike. And, that's, and they might be 58 years old, 60 years old, and they've got their rain stuff on, their briefcase is waterproof, it's strapped to their bike and their mother. And this is, it's a cultural change. They're getting fit. They, they, um, the, the, the culture has changed enough that the bike dominates, the car has to stop to let them through, and it doesn't always work. There's people from out of town that come in and break those sort of social rules. Um, but it's changing. Here's another one of those mysterious rain views. <laughs> here in another entry. <laughs> is this interesting? Did you going through? Or? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this was a bit more of a high-tech uh, example. We, we weren't uh, really sure what this was all doing, but it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like bubble wrap. Um, but it it's really was a, an innovative idea for transforming the, the fabric of existing buildings and, and using them for energy generation, water generation. Um, but it was pretty interesting, their vision of the future of transportation and very, you know, pedal powered or electric assist, you know, covered bikes that, you know, take you through um, parts of the town and apparently reindeer. I don't know why. <laughs> Aerial trams. Another huge trend um, is, again, we already touched on this, is the notion that we, we, can't, we cannot afford to have cities of the future that are really that amount of land appropriated around the planet just for one or two species. Just good for cockroaches, people, rats, dogs, and uh, cats, right? That we need to actually link our cities up to a wider web of diversity and figure out how to support the ecosystems required uh, to allow those species uh, to exist, coexist with us in natural systems and how we begin to do that right in the heart of cities um, with restoring waterways again, wetlands, etc. Uh, this was a, a vision uh, here in, in Mexico City and you see the wind turbines and, and restored uh, natural corridors through the project and watersheds um, in, in, in a green, green infrastructure beginning to form on, on existing buildings, etc. This, this is another vision for re-looking uh, at the shoreline of Seattle. And, and right now the paradigm is, of course, the typical engineered solution where you have a, a hard retaining wall, and, and this has all been uh, drained 
um, this, this part of Elliott Bay in Seattle used to have this incredible wetland estuary with, with shellfish and salmon. The salmon are all dead. The shellfish are toxic to eat now. And the shoreline has been destroyed. But like with my hometown, why can't we imagine a future where we serve as the, as the healers of that place? And, and imagine what it would be like for the citizens of Seattle if they could put on rubber boots and wade out in here and collect shellfish and be part of this uh, ecosystem like the native peoples were for thousands of years in that very place. And Seattle was named after Chief Seattle, who was uh, a, a tribal leader from, from this place. And, and this is the kind of edge that you should have in a, uh, a city that fronts the ocean, not the hard edge uh, that is devoid of life that we see now. And really, you know, it's a very different world when we realize that we are enriched by nature rather than having to push nature aside to have some sort of ego-based dominance over, over the natural world. And if we really are clever, and we can be a very clever species, then perhaps we can reinvent the ways that we need to engage commerce and industry that allows for a very different uh, interconnection to the natural world. This is an image as well that's kind of evocative of saying, well, what happens to these elevated highways and freeways, um, you know? And it's interesting, in downtown New York City, there is, uh, this has happened in a small stretch of, there's a downtown park that was an elevated freeway that was abandoned. And they basically just filled the top of it with soil, planted trees, and bushes, and now the residents have this incredible experience as they, they, they climb up on this elevated freeway and they're in a park, an elevated park, that essentially looks like, like, like that. And the interesting look at, at reusing <laughs> infrastructure that we've wasted money on. <laughs> um, so there are many, many examples. So this is looking at, in, in the, the Middle East, how you would begin to invite back into the fabric of the city the, the desert ecosystems that, that should be there rather than perennially pumping water or bringing in water and trying to pretend that this should be green when it really shouldn't be green. And, and perhaps there's areas where there is a natural oasis that, that was for thousands of years that is that really respecting the differences of ecosystems even within cities and in a more tropical part of the world. But here, really, we should have cities that really, where you can, if you land in the airport and get to the airport, you can tell where you are based upon the response of the architecture and the planning, which is very, very important. And a city, cities in Mexico should be dramatically different, whether you're uh, in the tropical parts of the country or the arid parts of the country. They should be very different. Everything about the, the materiality of the projects and the infrastructure of the projects, the aesthetics uh, of the communities and how they, they work should be different when you go from city to city uh, around, around the country. Um, this, this last little bit, before we get into a quick little discussion about all this, is really fascinating to me about, about technology. And at the beginning, I started talking about, you know, we, we can't expect technology to save us, um, and, and that is true. But it's interesting to think about how technology will integrate into this future, and what technologies we're going to spend our resources on keeping, and what technologies we're going to give up. And that's a topic that I think people are not talking enough about. And so if you consider the way we, um, the way our, our societies function right now, which is based upon a paradigm of cheap energy, we spend a lot of our money on technologies and on infrastructure where we, we use a lot of energy to move dumb things far distances. All right? Think about that for a minute. So think about a chair. What's so special about a chair and the butt sits on it? So we have a typical chair, and this chair might have come, the parts might have come from 10 different countries. And we put on, a tr you know, on trucks and on trains and on boats, pieces, and ship them all over the bloody place. And that only works as a model if energy is really cheap. Because who would, in their right mind, spend precious money and resources on bringing a chair from all around the world if it suddenly became really expensive when you could make a chair from something that grows here or from materials here. And, right? But compare, compare the energy, so the energy it took to, to, bring, to bring that chair to life from around the world, what might be greater than it took to create this laptop. Think about that for a minute. So this laptop 
also came from around the world, lots of different pieces and parts, and has a fairly significant environmental burden associated with us. But what I can do with this compared to what I can do with that is a very different thing. Same with one of these, right? And the power of, of smartphones and cell phones now, which is why people that have very little money have cell phones, because they prioritize the money that they do have around something that can do a lot for them connects them to a lot of people, gives them information, right? Does a lot for you. So you have a very, which is why people have TVs as well, <laughs> because they want to be connected. But they give up other things. So if you think about our society, not just the, the poorest people in our society, all of society, when, it, when the energy paradigm changes, what will you, what do you think society will decide to prioritize? And what will it get rid of really quickly? And I think we're going to enter into a paradigm of heavy, dumb things are going to come only from local, close at hand, and only really smart, powerful things are going to come from far away. Because we'll, we'll, you know, hopefully also from close at hand, we're going to learn how to make it closer at hand. But this notion of a global economy where we try to send everything anywhere, wherever we can make whatever we make cheapest anywhere, that's going to end very soon in my mind. Think about the ramifications to our economies when that ends dramatically and quickly, right? There's going to be a real big reshaping. But I think that it could be really interesting in how, uh, in how this will shape cities. We're becoming more and more interconnected. And we've seen this with the Arab Spring, we've seen this with the Occupy movement, you guys follow all this, and where people are using technology in ways to get connected. And we've seen this with the you know, leapfrogging of technology with like mobile phones and how quickly people are jumping over landlines. They don't want to spend the money on them. Why would you now spend the money on big, dumb infrastructure of phones that need cords when you can jump right ahead, right? We need to do that with water systems, transportation systems. We can't keep building in this sort of 19th century thinking uh, that, that is around them. And the, the way that this technology is expanding, the gap between the intelligence of a chair and the intelligence of a phone is widening dramatically every year. What you can do on this, compared to that, five years ago was closer, but now it's far, right? So it's pretty interesting when you think about it. But people are going to be able to get more and more information about their place just by holding up their phone, and it's going to immediately tell you things about what's happening around you that you didn't know before. So the average person, including people who don't have very much money, are going to be uh, they're going to be able to access information that in the past they would never have had. It's going to change society in really interesting ways. Um, and, and not just phones, of course, but things like wearable lenses and, and, and th you know, some stuff that you do see in science fiction is rapidly coming where you're going to be able to get information that you want merely by looking around, right? Well, when you think about the paradigm of travel, this notion that I flew here from Seattle to give this lecture, a person is also a heavy down thing. And so the notion of moving people all over the planet is, I think, a paradigm also that's going to end. So if you're going to see the world right now, because I think in 20 years, hardly anyone's going to be flying is my opinion. But we're going to be more connected as societies than ever before, virtually, and, and in very impressive ways. You might have me here as a hologram. I might be presenting to you in almost as good a fashion, or maybe, maybe in some way it's even better than we thought of, but probably not literally going to come here because it would be too expensive. Right? Someone said today American Airlines just for bankers again. So the, the, the airline industry is on a razor thin edge related to fuel costs, right? and it doesn't have to shift very far before the prices get out of whack that the average person can't afford and then it starts to fall apart really quickly and becomes something only the military has planes and only the super rich and then starts to change and get more expensive again. These things can change very, very, very rapidly, but society will prioritize things that give them better information, that make us smarter, that make us more connected. This, this is not an image of the future that I uh, am uh, um, promoting, but it's kind of funny when you look at what this is saying, there's a Glock G34 pistol crossing 44th Street, and under that we're on NYPD. And so this is kind of a joke about how we may have access to information all around us in a very different way soon that could 
make us safer, it could alert us to different things, um, but we're not going to, I don't think that these are the kinds of technologies that we're going to jettison, but we're going to find ways to invest in things that, that make us more connected. And, and so, you know, to kind of finish, uh, you know, I, what the question that I'm hoping that you guys are all working on is how to turn Mexico City and your communities into, uh, into living cities over time. Um, if you're interested in some of our information, uh, we're redoing all of our websites now. It'll be ILFI stuff soon, but you can still go to ILBI.org, and we have information on the Living Building Challenge. If you want information on the building tool that I <coughs> talked about at the beginning of the lecture, we have lots of research and resources um, that you can download, financial studies and, and information. I'm not going to go into this now. Um, and this other website has a ton of information on, on these ideas, cascadiagbc.org. And um, when you go to that website, there's different things to click on. I'm going to just just share with you a couple things. Um, one is Living Future, which is our conference. It's our namesake conference. And the women in the room will appreciate the theme of next year, which is Women Reshaping the World. The men are, are still walking. <laughs> Not as well as the women are, but still walking. <laughs> uh, and it's in May 2nd to the 4th uh, in Portland. And this conference, uh, this fly while you can. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but this conference is really important because it, it's where all the sort of projects that are pursuing the Living Building Challenge get together. And so you have about 800 to 1,000 of the leading architects and engineers that come together and share lessons and best practices and resources. Uh, and it's, it's a great event. <laughs> uh, and we've, we've had, uh, is, wouldn't you say it's a pretty good event? <laughs> <laughs> Being that twice, yes, and um, uh, it's a very powerful thing. So you're all invited uh, and register before the end of the month for the cheapest tickets because the price is still up. Um, and the other thing that we do is we are trying to build a global sort of network of ambassadors uh, that are helping us spread the word about the challenge and about the program. And uh, and we would encourage you uh, to join our network of ambassadors. We have. PowerPoint presentation and there's trainings that we can do to spread the word about uh, the Living Building Challenge in particular. So I really want to um, um, to encourage you uh, to, to join. Uh, we also have a free magazine. That, it's an electronic magazine that you can da download the past issues from uh, called TripTab. And it, has, it covers a lot of these issues about cities and, and infrastructure and, and rethinking architecture. Uh, it comes out quarterly, uh, and you're all, it's free, you're all welcome to subs uh, subscribe. Unfortunately, it's, it's only available in English um, at the time being, uh, but um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, we also have a design, a new design competition that you're invited to participate in, and it's to design an affordable uh, living home in a native Alaskan village in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. So that's way up north. In a very hostile climate, where these, where the, uh, where, where, where the people there have lived for a long time successfully, um, and but the things have been changing over the last hundred years, and they need a new, a new sort of prototype for for modern housing in some of these communities. And so we're partnering with with the government there, the housing authority, uh, to to encourage designers to come up with a new prototype for a living building uh, house in the Aleutian Islands. And there will be uh, some prize money uh, for the first place award, and the winning design uh, is going to be built. Uh, so if you want to work on a real living building project, potentially, um, this is a fun one to attempt. Um, so I want to mention that. And that's also on our website. Uh, and with that, that's the end of my official lecture. And I'm happy to stick around and talk for a few minutes. Thank you.
Well, it, it's going to have to be a mix of strategies. I mean, it's not going to be one thing, but I think that the fundamental basis is we have to have the communities that function properly as walkable communities. And when you when you make that the base denomination, it, everything else becomes easier. But you can't make walkable uh, uh, before you made it available for people to move. That, that's correct. They do go hand in hand, but it's planning decisions to get to the other place. So it will include public transportation, it really works. It will include safe access ways for bicycles and incurred. Oh, you know, Portland went through that. It was not a bike friendly city, it became a bike friendly city. It was not, it didn't, didn't have this that particular public transportation. So they, it is policy, it's investment, it's cultural shifts. Uh, but it will be, a, I think the future will have, there will be a mix, a diverse mix of solutions, but I don't think it will be automobile based on so my, it's my opinion. <laughs> um, Thank you. I think one of the, of the topics that you talked about is <coughs> restoring what exists already. Yes. Uh, is something that is a challenge here in our city, uh, to take what it exists and make it function better. And so, what are some of the, of the advice that you can give us on that topic to start as a private uh, practice or maybe involve the government in this topic? So, when you say, so tell me more about what, what the challenge is. I mean, adapting where it already exists to new and more efficient ways of, of design, but it already exists, so it is a big challenge for this city yes. because so huge and, and so it's a challenger. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. And yeah. so, uh, would you advise to start a private uh, practice around <laughs> Yes, or maybe involve also the government. Or what happens when you involve uh, when you might you want to make it a real thing? Yes. And you have this type of environment, this government, this situation. Here. So, is there are there any policies in place here in Mexico City that require the preservation of existing infrastructure, or can people tear down whatever they want? Whenever they want? Well, there are some uh, historical buildings in the historic like district, like facades that you have to preserve. It's like more of the the artistic uh, yeah. patrimony of our history. Well, it's, uh, I mean, maybe just the comments. Yeah, it's more because it's like, yeah. I mean, the solutions, I mean, I don't know all the, I don't know the conditions here uh, like you do. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's in, in, the, in the states uh, where, I, where I work, we work with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And the work that we do with them is to help understand how you could improve the performance level of these old buildings to meet modern standards, in fact, to meet living building standards even for energy use and water use, and still respect the, the fabric of that historic structure. And that's really, that's the kind of work that we, we do do in this space, because we do work in a lot of different places, but is really recognizing that many of our older buildings can be retrofitted very successfully if we have the right approaches and the right technologies applied and that can perform as well or better than many new buildings. Um, and so we ought to be um, doing so. But we tend to think that they're hopeless because they're old. And, and, and so um, and we have some research that we can connect you to on some of the strategies, if there's specifics. Um, another forum might be a, a better for in that discussion. <laughs> Well, I have an, maybe an idea, no? because um, I don't know if you know that Lainero is building a new building around here. Maybe it would be nice to have a group that could be involved in some in some way on that on that design, you know, because it, it would be really interesting if a community like this would be involved in the in the design of, a, of an interesting building done by the by the <coughs> university, for example, no? which would be really really great. And it would be like a, a job of, of a group of people that would be interested on doing that as a as a group and pushing the authorities to to really get get it done. I mean, you know, that would be like a, a nice way to do it on the 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 educational community first, and really spread it out after. You know, maybe. Yeah, and that's something. 
Let's <laughs> like the solution for the energy at all. But in other countries where the budget is really It's it's actually I mean, said, wait, your question is the solution for the energy. I mean in which like alternatives do we have like the budget like we can't afford like a triple plus facade or the interesting the living building challenge, we have projects that range in terms of their costs. From, there are some very expensive ones. Yeah. Uh, and you have a lot of very expensive buildings as well in Mexico City. So that we could start with those easily. <laughs> um, and then there's buildings that have much more modest budgets. But it has everything to do with what our expectations are and what, um, um, what we are choosing to spend money on. Now, if you're going all the way to the very poorest of the poor, clearly they need help from others that have more resources to be able to afford to do the kinds of things that they do. Uh, but but it, you know, there's a huge amount of projects in Mexico City right now that, that could afford to do a lot of what we're describing if they think differently about what they value and what the priorities are. And I don't know if this is the best example to give, um, but in the United States, for example, if you took a um, a middle middle class family, not not the wealthy, but a middle class family. Uh, and you looked at the, the typical house that a middle class family would buy, the amount of money that they would spend, which which uh, is not a huge amount of money, but it's it's obviously uh, tiny. Um, they they you can produce a net you can produce a net zero energy living building house for the same budget, but you would. You would we cut out other things that they're spending money on that they, they really don't need. And an example of that in the States is that everyone has a garage in the States. And, 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 a, and a, you know, they like to cover their cars and that kind of thing. And, and, and there's no, and there might not even be a security concern, they just like to have a garage. In fact, oftentimes they don't, Americans won't park in the garage, they just store junk in their garage and their car sits out on the street anyway. But the cost of building that garage is similar to the cost of buying your solar system to never have an energy bill again, but but there's but nobody would ever nobody would, right now in typical middle class America would say I don't want the garage I want the solar panels they would dismiss the solar panels and go for the, the garage so there's a whole bunch of decisions that we make of what we need and what we want that result in the cities that we have so uh, you know it, it it is possible to build. A lot of what we're talking about for a lot less money, but you have to have some trade offs if you have a limited budget. Um, now, the other part of what we're trying to do is solar and triple pane windows, and a lot of these things are very expensive right now because they're all red and they haven't been commoditized in the same way. And so, what, we, what we're seeing with solar in particular is the cost of an installed triple of solar is dropping dramatically. And, and the trend, again, it's one of those technologies like the cell phone that I think we're going to continue to invest in. And hopefully it becomes as cheap as a bicycle in the near future so that the technology isn't a barrier based on the economics. And right now it is. Uh, but over time, wouldn't it be wonderful if people could generate the electricity they need at almost any, you know, or any social economic level because the, that technology has been invested in property rather than coal, rather than other systems. So it's, it's going to take time. Right now, living buildings in this kind of infrastructure costs more upfront than traditional infrastructure, even though it pays for itself fairly well over a mid-term projection. But it's still, if you don't have any money, you don't have any money. So this is still out of reach. But we're trying to drive costs down so that it's cheaper, or you know, more and more people can afford to be these Well, um, we just reached like Seven billion people around the world. So yes. I, I'm just wondering, and the number is not going to be lower or less. Yeah, we hate playing So, <laughs> my question is um, if we have a global consciousness, we'll know we have to change, and uh, in that ideal cities um, are going to do a lot of good for us. Is that enough? Is that enough? Yes, like the solar energy or renewable energy is enough to satisfy all that demand? Well, 
I, I'm not sure if this is the heart of your question, but is the heart of your question that is there going to be a huge population crash? Is that really at the heart of your question? <laughs> <laughs> because I think that it's a it's a challenging question uh, and a sobering question to answer. You know, it's difficult to answer that question because you know, it hasn't happened yet. But it's hard to imagine that the population rate of increase that we have now that we can sustain much longer. Um, without some catastrophic impacts to, to human populations that are going to cause some very serious corrections to the way we do things. Um, so is it enough, what I'm talking about, is it enough to save us some time? Is that the question? <laughs> not to save us, but in your diagram of um, doing harm to the, to the land, yes. your program of being totally renewable, yes. All that demand, is it possible to, to... It is possible for the, for, it is possible, I believe, for the population that we have now. But regardless, we have a finite system. So where the upper limit is, even with the paradigm that I'm describing, I don't know. Uh, but there's, there's a limit. It still takes energy and resources to make solar panels. It still takes energy and resources. There's still only so much around. But I don't know what population number that is. It's a good question. <laughs> a tough question. From your presentation, so, uh, but I believe the real change, the needed change is at the scale of cities. Yes. Not at the scale of a single building. Yes. But still, your the living building challenge. You have to start somewhere. Yeah, it is buildings, but it's really meant, um, and this is why I segue into, into cities. Um, if, if all you can control right now is your one building, then this is what you should do with your one building, is the idea. But the better idea is interconnected district neighborhood scale infrastructure that's really working together. Cities, cities working much more like a network rather than one one independent thing. Is that your question? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. are you planning to come to this? Well, we already are. Yeah, that's what we're doing. But you, but you have to start. You have to start where you can create the impact. And what we're proving is what's possible now with buildings now, and then and what we're encouraging is projects that are much more at the neighborhood scale. Um, but it's not up to us when people decide to do that. So we're really putting up the standards. But we we talk about let's. Well, we didn't talk about cities and districts, and, and the buildings are models of what's achievable now at that scale. So, does that make sense? Yes, it's a Well, you know, each place is different, um, and I'm a big a believer in you need to understand a community before you make big suggestions. So, um, I. I have a lot of suggestions for my municipal leaders in Seattle where I live because I know that place. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't believe in sort of coming here and telling people what to do. So it would be more, could we have a dialogue so that you can figure out how to approach the people uh, here. But in our communities, we, um, we provide them with economic evidence. A lot of things come down to money for people, most people. Uh, so we have spent a lot of our research on looking at the economics of alternative systems, whether it's water systems or energy systems, looking at total costs of ownership, looking at, uh, at ways in which this will create a better environment. So we don't, when we're working with city officials, we don't start by making them feel guilty. We don't start by making them feel like they're dumb, that they're not thinking about this. We don't, uh, um, you know what I mean? We don't try to do any, any of that kind of baggage. Um, what we do try to do is inspire them and also show them arguments that they can't refute. That the are, model, sorry, huh? the model is yes. an expert, an expert, for example, if it's organized, yes. Even if it's not 
Can you get both certifications, like LEED and, and Living Building? Yeah. And what are the main differences between them? Yeah, in fact, uh, that um, couple of buildings I showed do both. 
Um, so they're, they're very different systems. Um, LEAD is uh, more of a prescriptive system, uh, where lip building challenge is more of a performance-based system. So what we set performance levels, and, and how you get to that performance level is up to you. So there's a lot of innovation then that can occur. Where LEAD, you have to do very specific things to get very specific points. And LEAD sort of stops at kind of a, a certain place in performance, and, and we, we only begin above them. So typically, you have projects most projects are still in the lead paradigm. The lead building challenges for those that are really wanting. So it's tends to be you know, it's harder to achieve. There's ironically there's less paperwork because it's based on actual uh, performance that we audit. There's another difference. Lead is based on, and in fact, just about every green building program in the world is based on promises, and you get a plaque. Ours is based on proof, <laughs> and we check up on it. Um, so it's a different. You know, it's a different philosophy, but we have had projects that have done both, and uh, you can. There's nothing, no reason why you can't. So. In, in Seattle, where I live now, yeah. they incentivize lead, uh, and now living building challenge in the downtown core for. Um, so the living building ordinance that I just mentioned, um, they um, will expedite the permitting process if you are doing this. So you get a faster permit is one thing. You get exceptions to different rules. You can build more density in places to get more economic return. If you're going to the living building, so the city has created a whole series of things to encourage developers to have a better environmental building as policy in the city. And they, they've done that with, with LEAD as well. So, and it really actually works. Um, people, it changes the economics of the projects when the city is willing to, uh, you know, change the math to help them with taxes or, with, you know, the prices of, of infrastructure charges. And uh, it can really incentivize innovation. Less taxes for the projects. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's the idea. Yeah. So, but. <laughs> Case. I think you're, what you're describing could happen in some places, but the Aleutian Islands are pretty, uh, they're pretty extreme. They're, they, uh, there's not going to ever be very many people living in, even, with the, even if everyone had a little bit built in houses that are great, the conditions are such that it's dark for six months, no light. The conditions are such that the winds blow and will knock you over. You know the, the the snow piles up. You know it's it's not the way most people. It's, it's why when the Bering Land Bridge happened, people kept heading the accident and they didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so in that particular case, I don't think so. But there could. So I think if you took what you're saying to a, a less harsh climate, then you then maybe it's uh, more. Is that one of the reasons you chose? What's that? Is that one of the reasons you chose that? No, they chose us. They came to us. The 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 the. the, the the native corporation came to us 
and said we want to we want a new housing prototype that is better for the environment, that is more tied to the place, that if we can afford to live in as fuel prices rise, will you help us do a competition? And so we actually said yes to them. So we didn't go to them. They came to us and said, will you help us? And we said yes. So that very different. Um, it would be like your native village, you know, anywhere saying, we need help. We have terrible conditions. Living buildings should be for us too, not just for not just for the rich. <laughs> so that was, that was it's an important competition. What's that? Different. Different. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, well, for some of the projects that you have made, I think that uh, it has an impact on, on the population around it. How do they, how do they affect in a positive way and a negative way? I don't know if they, I mean, well, yeah. yeah. It's too, I mean, it's too soon to tell we don't have enough of these projects yet to know really how they're going to impact, and not, you know, really. Um, we have a lot of uh, feedback on how it's, like I mentioned, how the school and the, the sewage treatment plant, how it's beginning to change all the people that come there and they're getting exposed. So we have a lot of examples of people's mindsets being changed because it's so different than, than what they see. Um, but. I'm sure there are negatives that we're not yet aware of. There's always, you know, we're not perfect. And we're going to learn that we did, that our program needs to be fixed and improved and changed and that these buildings can, so there will be something, but it's too soon to tell um, what, what the, the, we've seen the upsides, haven't seen the downsides yet. <laughs> but I'm sure there's some. So. What's your, oh, sorry. What's your analysis on a typical return of it? the investment for a corporate uh, building like the one in Seattle versus a corporate yep. or a regular building. Go to our website and download this study because we did a real huge economic analysis of different building types and different planet sites. It's based on uh, US economics, it's really different. Uh, but uh, the KMAX, there it really varies depending on where in the country and how big the building is on all those things. But the paybacks are not as, are not very long. They range from, in this scenario, there's 36 scenarios we looked at. They range from uh, three to five years on the lowest end to about 22 uh, years on the highest end, depending on which building. So a pretty big spread, but not, uh, the first cost premiums are not uh, as, well, twice the cost or three times the cost. And for a non-living building? I mean, what's the return on the investment for a regular building? Well, it really, it depends. I mean, it's like there's too many variables. I, but I would download this study, and it'll give you 200 pages of answering that question. So I mean, it's a cost. Is a, it's like asking a bunch of car costs. Well, what you know? Well, how old is it? How what you know? Condition? What make? Is it a Lamborghini or is it? A, you know, it's cost and paybacks vary so dramatically by. Where you are, even in the U.S., to be all over the world. I just want to know if right now at this moment is it better or worse? Well, um, living buildings will always be better economically given a certain amount of time because you never have an energy bill, a water bill, lower operating maintenance costs. The question is, how quick does it pay back? And so it's all over the map. Over time, it's always better. It's always better. Yeah, always better. But it's a question of whether you can upfront the initial investment to make it perform to this level, the first cost premium. And what we're saying with LEED is the first cost premium has gotten a lot smaller, especially in markets like Seattle where there's a lot of LEED buildings, people have figured it out. Living Building Challenge still has a gap, but it will start to get smaller too. But it costs more money to have your own energy and water utilities in, you know, in, in your own projects, so you have to pay for that. But then you own it and, and you control it. <coughs> And so it always wins, but just a question of how quickly it does it. Okay. So. You were saying that the old people create uh, raising hope, will rise the prices, and that will force us to change our way of living and a lot of things. But I would like to know how, uh, what the impact do you think is going to be or could be of ecological taxes that is also rising the prices, but not because of a lack of uh, energy or resources. Uh, ecological taxes. Uh, 
about the taxes. Taxes, yeah, like increasing prices because well, that are related to the cons consumption of uh, oil products or derivates. Yes. And what do you think that will be the impact of that pricing, the price rising to the te technological development? that you were talking about also, like the cell phone thing. Oh yeah, it's going to, yeah. But um, it's going to, it's, it's hard to predict what will rise when and where and why. I mean, that, it's the future, it hasn't happened yet. Yes. Um, but all commodities are going to get expensive, and, and, and including things like this. My, my point is, is what are we going to choose to uh, save up money for? What are we going to choose to make investments around? And that's why, uh, I believe that we're going to continue to invest in things that we're going to have to jettison a lot of our costs, but we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to continue to prioritize things that really provide incredible value to us as a society. That will also tend to keep those particular commodities lower than the rise of costs in other places where we can give up our support of those systems. Uh, does, is that, make, yeah. is that addressing? So it's, Economics, and I'm not an economist. I like read um, books as part of our work, but I'm not an economist. But but we, we, you know, the, the, all commodities are going to rise, and the ones that we continue to invest in, the, the curve of their of the inflation of those commodities will will not be as steep as in others where you begin to uh, abandon very quickly. If the price of a, the price of an airline ticket will be interesting to watch over the next ten years, and it's going it's based upon volume. Flying, flying and fuel costs. And so the, the interrelationship there can change very quickly. Is it? No? Is it? Yeah. All right. Should we uh, close for now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.